Our scripture reading, let us turn to 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 4, 5, verse 5. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the scripture, which is able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort, and with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own distress, because they have itching ears, they will heap upon themselves teachers, as they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, Fulfill your ministry. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for your word and the direction and the clarity that it gives us. Father, sometimes I see the, the recorded word as I hold it in my hand as the greatest sign of your grace, that you cared so much for us that you gave us evidence of who you are and who we are and what we are to each other that's so clear that we can read it for ourselves. I pray that as we do that in the weeks and months and years to come, we will be molded into the image of Jesus Christ and His, His grace and His love and His generosity. As we express our generosity at this point, Lord, we ask You to receive our offering and use it for Your glory so that Your kingdom will expand and Christ will be able to return to a world prepared for His kingship. I ask You for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, I'm only human. Well, I'm just a man. Lord, help me to be all I can be and all that I am. Show me the stairway that I have to climb. But for my sake, teach me to take one day at a One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all that I'm asking from you. Lord, help me today, show me the way that I have to do. Well, yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. Lord, help me today, show me the way, one day at a time. Do you remember when you walked among men? Well, Lord, you know if you're looking below, it's worse now than then. The pushing and the shoving, it's crowding my mind. So for my sake, take me to take one day at a time. One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all that I'm asking from you. Lord, help me today, show me the way that I have to be. Well, yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. Lord, help me today, show me the way, one day at a time. Yes, help me today, show me the way, one day at a time. Gentlemen, that was a blessing. Really appreciate that. Uh, at this point, I want to uh, presume on your grace and um, present a couple of commercials. Uh, really would like to uh, instill your help in some things that the church is trying to do. Uh, one of the things that we are trying to do right now is fill a couple of positions in the um, the nursery. We have three or four positions available. I don't know what's going on here, but it's not advancing. So, um, I hope that some, you'll all consider that very carefully. That this concept of nursery work. Uh, I, I just get the feeling. I'm presuming a little bit here. I know, but I get the feeling that some people have the opinion that nursery work is babysitting. And I just, I just want to challenge that concept because nursery work is actually bricklaying. It's almost that hard, but it's that necessary because it's in the nursery while children are still in diapers that they are learning more than they will learn the rest of their life together. And you have the opportunity to instill in them the basic discipline of coming to church and listening to a Bible story and 
venting your prayer requests, and I know it, it gets old praying for their cat every week, but they're learning to pray. And then you can just, a short little phrase like, Jesus loves me or God created everything, that you can create that discipline or lay the foundation for that discipline of memory, ver, me, uh, scripture memory. Uh, and it's just foundational. If we don't do this while they're in the nursery ages, then we, we're a little bit, not not drastically, but a little bit behind the rest, of the, t- the rest of their life. And if we can get that head start going where they will be uh, accustomed to that discipline, then perhaps we'll change their whole life. And many, many of us can, can remember the Sunday school teachers and the, the nursery workers that just faithfully served, not realizing they were doing something so significant. And I want to give you guys the opportunity. If there's something you're interested in doing, just let me know. My phone number is in the bulletin. You can send me a text. You can give me a call. You can pull me aside in the foyer. uh, Send an email. Whatever is comfortable for you, just let me know. And uh, we'll put you together with, actually with my wife. She's going to be coordinating that. And uh, we'll get you started on that. I think it would be a great ministry for many of us. Uh, Second commercial that I want to give this morning is for next week. Next week, we have the privilege of uh, inducting some new members into our church. I'm excited about that because that, that, that represents a, a next level of commitment in a person's life. And if you're interested in becoming a member of the church, same thing. Just, just get in touch with me somehow. My contact information, like I said, is in the bulletin. Just let me know. It's a short little, well, usually it turns out into a long conversation, but it's, it's more fun than a conversation. Just a couple of questions that I ask about your salvation and whether you've been baptized or not, and, and then we go from there. And we would love to induct as many people as possible next week. This next commercial, and I promise this is the last one. This commercial is, uh, well, I found out something about myself this week. And I realize for most of you, many of you, this won't be a surprise. But for me, it was kind of an awakening. I found out that your pastor does not make a very good secretary. Uh, last week, I announced that the, the uh, annual meeting is coming up. It was announced last week that, that the uh, meeting was going to be the 5th of February. And I had put some documents out in the foyer for you to peruse. And I'm glad I did because I found out that I didn't do a very good job in some places uh, in that co- those constitutional suggestions, those uh, updates we're going to make there, and in the membership lists out there. So please look at them again, okay? We've got next week, and then the week after that is going to be the meeting. And if I've made any more mistakes, I will, I will fix them, okay? But I'm just not a very good secretary, and so I need your help to look at that stuff and and find those mistakes that I made. And please, if you have questions about what's on there, write them down. That's what makes good discussion at the annual meeting, is exactly how is all of this going to work. So please, please be ready for that. Um, At this point, we can go ahead and dismiss our kids for Children's Church. Uh, Some of them are already back there. That's fine. Um, Before we look into the God's Word, though, we need to pray and make sure that God is guiding us. So please pray with me. Uh, Father, I want to thank you for the privilege I have of serving you by studying your word, the honor that it is to spend time with you, learning what you want said, and I confess that I'm not infallible, and when I take on a topic like this morning when there is so very much to say, I would ask you that every word be necessary and helpful and guided by your spirit, that we might grow and be encouraged to be disciples of Jesus Christ. I pray for all this in his name. Amen. Uh, We're continuing our series this week that I have been calling Jesus's Grand Design. Uh, We're looking at what used to be called, uh, back in the, actually before my time, Uh, It was called the deeper life. How we can get a deeper relationship and a deeper commitment to Jesus. If you're a business person or a leadership-oriented person, you might recognize the things that I'm saying as discipleship values. The things that direct a disciple in how, how to be a follower of Jesus Christ. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about the need to make Jesus our Lord. 
And then last week I talked about the significance of his kingdom and the disciples focus on what God is doing uh, and investing in that. Today I want to look at the significance of biblical truth. And I want to evaluate and try to explain at least partially what the Bible tells us about how to react to what the scripture says. Now for me this came to light as a significant issue several weeks ago. I had reason to be doing some research on the internet, and I was reading another church's doctrinal statement. It's a local church. You would recognize the name of it if I uh, decided to say it, but I'm not going to because this is being recorded for the internet, and I don't want to embarrass anybody. But I was kind of surprised as I read through this doctrinal statement when it came down to their doctrine of revelation. They actually allowed for continuing additions to the scripture. They thought that God is still revealing truth, new truth, that should be considered on the same level as the Bible. And I was surprised, I wasn't shocked by it, but I was surprised that there were still churches right here in the north central part of Oklahoma that would teach such things and accept such things. And it prompted me to ask myself, how does a person know something? I'm, I tend to try to be a kind of an amateur philosopher anyway, and so I thought, well, if, if they're still considering that more scriptural knowledge can be revealed, and others say that it's closed off and it's complete, we, can't, we don't add anything to it, how do we really know things? Of course, most of us uh, would um, probably just instinctively say we know things through our senses, what things we can touch, things we can smell, things we can hear, give us knowledge. And that's true, except once in a while, it's not true. Many of us have had that, that sensation of seeing something out of the corner of their eye and nothing's there. Or your ears playing tricks on you and hearing something that wasn't accurate. Or uh, if you're like me and you spend a, t a lot of time reading, you'll be reading along and something you're familiar with and all of a sudden you realize you've misread a word. Your eyes have played a trick on you. So that's mostly reliable, but not completely reliable. And that has led to a, a concept that we need to reason to determine knowledge. And there was actually a book written in um, the 1790s called The Age of Reason, and they were trying to bring in a, a time when all knowledge was, was rational, and all knowledge was thought out by the human brain. And that's something we should consider, but not all brains are healthy. And some people come up with things that are kind of bizarre. On the flip side of that is intuition. I'll be honest with you, I don't understand intuition. I don't feel like I have very much intuition, but I have learned to rely on my wife's intuition. Once in a while, I'll be considering something and she'll say, I don't think that's a good idea. And I'll say, really, why? I don't know. It's just not a good idea. And I have learned to listen to that. She just instinctively knows. Of course, the highest level on this chart anyway, for knowing things is revelation. And when you talk about the, the science of knowing that's not always divine revelation. In the church, we usually talk about divine revelation, but revelation is actually something that's reported. You might hear somebody say, you ought to see that train wreck I saw yesterday. They're going to give a report on that. They're going to reveal what they know. Now, if you're like me and you put all this together in one basket, and you shake it up, you pour it out, you still have one question left. What does the Bible say about our source of knowledge? What does the Bible say about itself as a source of knowledge? And I want to start this morning in 2 Timothy with the passage that was read just a little bit ago and look at what Paul says about Scripture. And then I'm going to look in a few minutes about what Peter says, the two leading apostles. Is that the way we say it? At least they've got a lot to say about a lot of things. Now, as we turn to 2 Timothy, we have to realize what we're reading 2 okay. Timothy is probably, highly probably, the last thing that we have in Scripture that Paul wrote. He's in prison in Rome, and most authorities will tell you that within months, Paul will be beheaded. 
And so he's writing a letter to Timothy to encourage him as what we would call the heir apparent. He's the one who will have to pick up where Paul left off and continue the work of the church and the the team that Paul put together. And as we get to the start of this passage, he talks about how Timothy had learned so much from his grandparents and, and his mother about the Old Testament and how it was capable of making him wise for salvation. He talks about how he had followed Paul through the years and seen how Paul had lived out his faith in Jesus, and many times that meant through persecution. And then he gets down to the passage that we have today, starting in verse 16, where Paul says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. In some ways, this, these two verses are a trap for people like me. Because there are so many words in here that you can just get sucked into because they mean so much. One of the things that, that I look at when I look at a passage like this is, am I sure I understand the words right? And when I read that first, those first two words, all Scripture, what is he talking about? Well, in Paul's time, there was no New Testament. It had not been collected yet. Now, this may have been Paul's last letter, but the probability is Peter hasn't written yet, and we're pretty confident that John hasn't written anything yet, so that's four books in the New Testament. If we check the timeline, we can read Probably the book of Hebrews hadn't been written yet. So there's a lot of the New Testament that doesn't even exist yet. So what's he talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about what they had in their day as stories and revelations and and teachings that would guide them through their life. Then he says, it's God-breathed. Mine, it says it's breathed out by God. The NIV says God breathed. Uh, I'm not sure what um, was read this morning on the platform, but it said by inspiration. The Greek word is theonoustos, and that is God, and breathed. It doesn't mean inhale or exhale. It just means breathing. And What it means is that God instilled himself, breathed out from himself, something of himself for those who recorded the Bible so that He is in there somehow. And so he breathed this out so that it could be recorded for us for our profit. That word is just straightforward so that we would have a gain. And then my favorite part of the favorite words in this verse, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Why those words? Why those words in that order? And in this particular case, that's significant. To understand it, I would ask you to imagine a pathway. And the first word is training. I'm sorry, is teaching. And and in some translations, it says doctrine. And through the doctrine and the teaching of the Bible, we find out which path we're supposed to be on. It's why I'm so excited about the the nursery work and the children's work because it starts them out on that path early. But as we all know and have experienced ourselves, that sometimes we get off the path. And so we need to be reproved. And I, 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 maybe I'm the only one who did this, but I assume there are others that read that word reprove and think that it means the same thing as scolding, that we need to be scolded when we get off the path. But The English word reproved can be understood that way. The Greek word a little bit less. It's more just pointing out that there's an error. So that you know, because a lot of times we don't know. If we don't have something from God, we can't tell when we've gotten off the path. Once we know we're off the path, we need to know how to correct that. And so the next word that Paul uses is correction. It's how to get back on the path. Once we're on the path, we need training in righteousness, training in how to live life rightly, how to do what's right in God's sight so that we stay on the path from that point on. And that's why Scripture is given to us, because sometimes we miss the path. 
But Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, the purpose of all of this is that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Um, one of the older translations, instead of complete, it says uh, perfect. And it's confused some younger believers. Do. do we really get to be perfect someday? Well, yeah, someday, but not in this life. We have a consistent walk with God. We never get to the point where we don't need him anymore. The English word perfect, actually, um, in that transition between Middle English to Modern English, it means pre, it meant pre-fit, to be pre-fitted for something. Like if you went down to your tailor and uh, he cut out all the pieces of a suit and pinned them together and you go down and you try it on and he says, yes, it fits right now. You can take it off and I'll sew it all together. It's to be pre-prepared. I really got the, the gist of this word by reading Plato, believe it or not. Uh, Plato was having an argument with one of his um, nemesis in, in Athens at one point, And they were sitting in the arena waiting for the Olympics to start. And in comes this athlete. And Plato looks at him and he says, there is a perfect young man. And that really freaked me out. So I went and looked up that word. It turns out to be the same word as our word where he's not saying that he's achieved uh, flawlessness, but that he has everything at this point in his development that he can continue to develop down the road. And why do we need to continue to develop down the road? So that we're ready for every good work. Every opportunity that Jesus gives us to represent him well, we'll be ready for that. So Paul gives us, a, 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 in a nice little nutshell, how the Scripture is supposed to work in our lives. It teaches us, it reproves us, it corrects us, and it trains us in righteousness. Peter adds something to the doctrine for us today. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we can find out what Peter has to offer. This, again, is probably the last thing Peter wrote that we have he may have uh, been facing his own execution in the very near future, and he's writing to a group of churches that are in what we would call the northern tier of Turkey. He's writing to, primarily to Jews who are part of what's called the Diaspersia. That's the Jews that aren't living in the promised land. And among these people, there is this tendency to uh, elevate experience. They would talk a lot about dreams. They would talk a great deal about angels coming to visit them and speaking to them. You'll see a similar teaching in the first few chapters of Hebrews, where the author of Hebrews addresses that, that issue. The way Peter deals with it is he goes back and talks about the revelation that he had. His highest mountaintop experience, we would call it, it literally happened on a mountaintop when he was with Jesus and James and John, and suddenly there was this great cloud that enveloped them, and Jesus was transfigured. And Peter got to see Jesus talking to Moses and to Elijah, and he doesn't mention it, but he, I'm sure he's remembering the, the thing that he just instinctively said, Lord, let me build a couple of houses and we'll just stay here for the rest of our life. Then he heard a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. In other words, put Jesus not just on the same tier as Moses and Elijah, but a little bit higher. He's not diminishing Moses or Elijah. He's just saying Jesus is of such a nature that he is even higher than these Old Testament heroes. And then he says to the people that he's writing to, verse 19, chapter 1, he says, And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention, as a lamp shining in the dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. You can just hear him bubbling up, okay? He just can't help but break into some attempt at poetry. A lamp shining in the darkness, the dawn, day dawns and the morning star rises. Why? Because we have something even better 
than my great experience with God on the mountaintop. Something more sure, something we would do better to pay attention to than dreams and visions and new revelation. The Word of God. He goes on in verse 20 to say, Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. That word interpretation is a challenge to me. I don't, it doesn't seem to fit the context very well. We're not talking about understanding Scripture. We're not talking about uh, telling people what it means. We're talking about the value of the Scripture over experience. So I looked up the word. And I found it in, in several of my commentaries, and they all contradicted each other. So I found the word in a lexicon. And they didn't say much about it because this is the only place in the Bible this word occurs. And so I got out my theological dictionary of the New Testament. I'm so glad God gave me a computer. Because to carry around the theological dictionary of the New Testament, you need a wheelbarrow. It's a huge book. And in that book, there is only one alternative translation given. The word explanation. What Peter may be saying here to us is that nobody wrote Scripture to explain something they predetermined. The people who were inspired by God wrote Scripture under God's direction. That's what he says in verse 21. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It fascinates me that God could inspire Scripture and ask, I don't know how many authors to be involved, from Moses to Isaiah to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Peter, and, and Luke, a Greek. And as he inspired them to record, you can see their personality and their temperament. He didn't wipe them out. He didn't just robotically control them as they were recording. He allowed them to put their own personality into it, but yet accurately record revelation from God. Revelation that is so sure and can guide us so well the way Paul described that even if we have some kind of an encounter with an angel or a dream of some kind, we are to make those experience is subordinate to what God has recorded on paper for us. We have a great deal of confidence in the scriptures that we have. We have a great deal of, of uh, guidance and freedom to read it and live it, but so many people tell me, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. Pastor, you say I should read the Bible, but I just can't pronounce all those names. Or, Pastor, I should do this or that or the other. I want to give you five techniques this morning. And I put the, the, the hand out here in front of you so that you can see on the fingers of your hand the five different ways to intake the Bible. And we're going to start with the little finger this morning. The little finger is the weakest finger on your hand. And so we put the easiest technique on the little finger, and that's to hear the Bible. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, Paul is writing, and he says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You know, we, we are a little bit spoiled, because most of us in this room have one of these somewhere in their pocket or their purse. And you can download an app that will have the Bible in any language or any translation you want for free. And if you download one that I've downloaded, it will actually read it to you. So when you're sitting at the breakfast table or shaving in the, and looking in the mirror or whatever it is that you do where your hands are busy but your mind isn't, you can listen to the Scripture. And you can consider yourself in good company. Because until about the middle of the 1500s, the vast majority of believers in Jesus Christ 
could not afford a Bible. In fact, the Bible was so precious in the Middle Ages that even kings could not afford the Bible. At one point in England, they had a Bible on the pulpit of of the main church in every county, and they had to chain it down because people would steal it. But people would come every Sunday morning and listen to the Bible being read. That's why in our worship service today, we still have a time set aside to read Scripture because the Scripture was meant to be heard. Now, you can put a little more effort into it and read it yourself. In Revelations chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. And I believe that as you read the book of Revelation, he'll say several things like that. And he's talking about the whole Bible because God knew that was going to be the last book that he inspired in the Bible. So blessed are you when you read Scripture. And you've heard me encourage people, and I'm glad to hear that some people have picked up that challenge, to read the Bible all the way through in one year. Good on you. You're going to grow from that. Now, I know you're going to get to those passages I get to it every year when I get to Leviticus. Boy, I wish I could just skip this part. Or when I get to the first 10 chapters of 1 Chronicles, name after name after name after name after name, no story, no detail, no nothing. Just those Hebrew names that always tie my tongue in a knot. But you know, somehow that feeds my soul. That strengthens me to follow Jesus. I I have experienced the blessing of that. And I encourage you all to to have some kind of a plan to read through the Bible all the way through, all every word over, if you want to do it in five years, it's an easy math to do. You just read one chapter a day and then do it again and then do it again. Young people, if you start out that way, when you're in your teens, by the time you reach 40, you're going to know the Bible backwards, forwards, upside down. And you're going to have so much guidance that your life is going to be blessed in special ways. Keep moving up the hand here. We get to the the word study. When we think of studying, we can think of the Bereans in Acts chapter 17. Paul had just been kicked out of Thessalonica because they didn't like what he was saying. But the Bereans took the time to study the word to see if what Paul was saying was true. The author calls them more honorable because they spent time studying the word. Now, as I've encouraged people to read the Bible through in a a period of time, maybe a year or five years, that would mean that you would read something almost every day. But I would not encourage you to study something almost every day. Actually, what I would encourage you to do is study one passage a week. It might be the passage that you know is coming up in your Sunday school quarterly. Or if you're a Sunday school teacher and you're teaching, just spend a little time just studying that passage. And I realize that I scare some people when I say that because they look at my library and they say, I can't even afford to buy all those books. You don't need any books, really, to study the Bible. In fact, if if you do need to invest in something to help you study the Bible, just buy a good study Bible. Uh, The NIV study Bible is my personal favorite because it does not tell you in those books black and white areas where there's differences of opinion, it won't tell you this is the way you have to believe. It will list all three or four major understandings. And then you can ask yourself, which one does God mean by this? You really only have to ask three questions to study a passage. Do I know what it says? You know you know what it says when you can paraphrase it. We can just say it in your own words. Okay? Do I know what it means? And there's where you might need the commentary in a study Bible. And do I know what to do with it? Do I know what God is asking of me? And if you spend a week with a chapter asking yourself that question, 10 or 15 minutes a day, you're going to find out that God will put things in your mind. God will bring things to your attention that will change your life. But it doesn't stop there. We are also encouraged to memorize the word. Psalm 119 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By hiding God's word in your heart. That means memorizing. 
And I told you this was going to get harder as we went. And memorizing, at least for me, is probably the hardest one here. Because I don't have a good memory. In fact, I got a better forgetter than I got a rememberer. And so I have to just write it down. Just take a verse or a passage and just write it down. Sometimes I'll even write it on a three by five card and stick it in my pocket. And when I've got a minute, I'm waiting for something. I just pull it out and read it for a week. And then the next week I try to say it without pulling it out. And then I save that card because I know six weeks from now I'm going to have to pull it back out because I'll forget. And I'll have to review that. The hardest one of all is what I reserve for the thumb. And that's meditation. In Psalm chapter 1, it says, Blessed are those who don't, who don't hang out with sinners, who don't violate God's law, but those who think about the Word of God. Actually translated meditated. Uh, you know what meditation means? I, when, when I say this to young people, meditation, they think about that Eastern meditation where you sit and you try to empty your mind. And God never encourages that. Don't, don't ever fall for that because that gives other powers the opportunity to stick things in your thinking. What meditation actually, the word meditation actually means in Hebrew is mutter. And what David is encouraging here is as you're walking from the house to the barn every morning, you say, you know, I just read that passage, and it said that if I, if I hang out with those people, I'm going to lose. But if I think about God's Word, then I'm going to gain. And so I'm going to think about God's Word today. And I wonder what I could think about for God's Word today. Does that mean that I should think about it all day? Or does that mean that I should just kind of, you know, when I get a free break? Or does that mean that I should talk to other people about it? And just ask yourself questions and mutter about it and kind of mull it over in your mind. Ask yourself and answer yourself questions about the passage. Think about it for a little while. And that's really hard because our, our brains don't like that. Our brains will try to distract you from that. The world will give you something to do that's more important. It takes a lot of discipline to meditate on God's Word. Now, the significance of that hand is more than just a memory aid. I want you to imagine, if you will, that I'm trying to hold my Bible in my hand. I can kind of hold it without hearing, but it gets a little weaker. And if I take hearing and reading out, then I don't really have a good grasp on the Bible. It's, it's very tenuous. If I take hearing, reading, and meditating out, or memorization out, then I'm really weak. But can you imagine what it would be like to try to hold this Bible without meditation? You know, if I take my thumb off of there, I've just lost my grasp on the Word. And so it's more than just a memory aid. It's a teaching on how to get a good, firm grasp on what God has to say. So from Paul and Peter today, we learn that the Bible has some practical implications in our walk with Jesus, and we learn the value of the Scripture in a disciple's life. But God has made a very specific promise to us if we will use His Word properly. This is in Joshua chapter 1. Joshua is about to lead the people into the Holy Land, and he's a little nervous. That makes him normal. And God says to him, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. The book of the law is the things that Moses has written. He says, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. You know what surprised me the most about that passage? Is every word in that verse is very clear. If we will live our life by the Bible, the whole Bible, not just our favorite passages, if we, if we will take the time and go to the effort to learn what God has said and to try to live by it, the overall effect is going to be that we'll prosper 
Now, I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher. I'm not saying you're going to get rich, but things will go well for you. And you'll have success. Primarily because God will guide you into the things that you invest in. And he'll invest, call you to invest in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And he will call you to invest in the kingdom of God. And the other things that we're going to talk about in this series. So I hope you'll come back and hear what else the Bible has to say about being a disciple. Beyond simply saying that the Bible is the best source of knowledge for those who want to follow Jesus. To that end, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your word. And I confess that there have been times when I have not understood it properly. There are times when I've just outright ignored it. There's times when I've wanted to do other things and found out that that's not the way to prosper. Father, there may be people in this room who wish they'd heard this message a long time ago to, to know the benefit of a consistent diet of your word and the growth that it can bring and the guidance that it can provide and the protection that comes with it. This morning, I want to thank you for your grace. That overcomes all of our weaknesses and all of our mistakes and draws us close to you anyway. And as we seek to live a life that is governed by your word, we ask you to help us understand it and apply it. And when the opportunity comes, even to communicate it so that you get the glory. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.